Serving defines us because Jesus said that others will know we belong to him by the way we love. And so as we serve through acts of compassion to others, we reveal the love of Jesus and we can share his love with others. And we do this uniquely as a church because of a unique people he's brought together, because of unique resources that we have as a church and unique partners that he has connected us with all throughout our city, whom we serve as they're serving in their place of expertise and in places in the city. Each of us have been uniquely gifted by God to serve him. You can find your place here as we all seek to serve our city together. All right, good morning. It's great to see you. I have been waiting all week long to come together and worship the Lord with you and proclaim that he is more than able to do whatever he desires to do in your life and my life. I have longed to be with my church family this week and worship him. All of the images, the news that's coming out of the Middle East, so troubling. The long and complicated conflict between particularly Hamas and Israel, and we can separate Hamas from the Palestinians, but all that's been going on there uh, in these days has just been gut-riching. And though it's been like a time bomb there for many, many years, and it has gone off throughout history, it seems, this one feels different. And so this past week, I reached out to a couple of friends of mine who I knew were there with groups and just trying to get out and uh, tracking along with them. How's it going? I also reached out to David Stern, who is the rabbi at Temple Emmanuel, our good neighbors right across the street here. We've been friends for a long time, partnering together in the city on a lot of different um, you know, tragedies or needs that we have. This is going to be a major humanitarian uh, need. And so you have half the population, may, you may have heard, are children. And so we're going to spend some time praying um, toward the end of our service today, just praying for all who are involved, for Palestinians, Israelis, everybody, and yes, our partners who are there on the ground. Praise be to God. You may know now, if you didn't already, you know, the Gaza Strip is a small piece of land. It's 68 um, square miles there. To give you some relative sense, uh, Plano is 72 square miles. There's 2 million people who live in that area, one of the most populated spots on the planet. And uh, they're all being forced then, you know, to, to move south. Some have described it in years past as, a, as an outdoor prison where they live. And so our first response is heartache and empathy and love. And so I want us to, to do that as a church family to really challenge us all to pray. But what do you do with something like this. Mr. Fred Rogers said that when he was a kid, um, when troubling images or stories would be seen or on the news, his mom would always tell him, look for the helpers. There's always helpers. And today I rejoice that I get to serve alongside you. I get to serve as the pastor of a church who is known to be present, to show up when helpers are needed. I have a good friend of mine who's a pastor in, here in our community right here who uh, said to me recently, he reached out and said, Jeff, every time something happens, your church is there. Like, this is a pastor of another major church in our area. And he said, the, you guys are just amazing and so inspiring to us and to our church family. Whenever there is a tornado um, when there are racial tensions, you know, in, in our city or when there, there, there is a need, even when it, or more recently, I think, I don't know when it, if it was Maui, when we, we, we sent our, our, our TBM team there. Um, I don't know if it was Ukraine perhaps, but it was more recent than that. And he said, every time something happens, the police shootings, every time your church is there, y'all are so quick to mobilize, so quick to move and you're present when there's a need. And I, I just want to say to all of you, all of us as members, those of you who are guests, you need to know this. If this is your first time here, we don't just gather to sing songs and think we've done church. That's not church. 
the church, you may know this, ecclesia is a called out people. The word ecclesia means called out ones. Called out though, not to hide out. Called out to receive his grace, called out by God, and then sent back into the world. In John 17, Jesus said, you're not of this world. Now, some have thought that means I'm not of this world. Let's hide out. Let's just get in our little Christian colony and just live and whoo, it's tough out there. No, he says, you're not of this world. Thus, I send you or yes, and I send you into the world. And so it's our difference that, that changes lives. It's living this life. So again, if you're a guest, you need to know our church is amazing. And I am so humbled when I think of our mission partners out there, when I think of the men of Nehemiah who are going to be with us next week, when I think of TBM, Texas Baptist men, now Texans on mission, when I think of Cornerstone Ministries or uh, gosh, the homeless kitchen there started by one of our members. When I think of Brother Bills through the years, when I think of the Bob Herrera Vickery uh, Center of ministry, it's, it's us, it's you. And it's not just the church, like those people, our church is doing some great things. What I want to do today is bring it right down to each of us. What are you doing? What's your ministry? You should be able to answer that quickly. And if you can't, I'm going to give you some help today. Okay. And so we're going to look at what it is to serve the Lord. And, and in this historic season, we've been looking at the distinctives that mark us. And if you're a guest, it's a great day to be here. Next week, even better. Next week's the big day, right? When we're coming together at 10 o'clock, all of us in the sanctuary, come early, get a seat. Uh, we're we're going to have overflow if we need it, but you come, be ready to worship the Lord. One church, all in one place. We're going to pack the house and uh, it's going to be an amazing day. We're going to walk back through these distinctives, but we're going to talk about the future ahead. It's our 84th anniversary. We, we've been saying Christ centers us. You know, we are a church that's focused on him. Scripture guides us in everything we do. He has uniquely resourced us with people and, and, and a collective ministry together. We said that cultural engagement compels us to go. And last week we said we go with compassion. We, we go with conversations. We do a lot of listening. Not, we're here to serve you, but how can we serve you? And how can we answer your questions? We do a lot of listening, and each of us do this in our personal lives. And then we said we bring clarity of the gospel. This is why we do what we do. And, and so next week, we're going to talk about that. We're even going to dream about the future together. We're going to talk about even, even what our campus might look like in the future. And I'll be, um, you know... Dreaming with you. We're going to talk a lot about that. And it's going to be just a great day. We're going to have lunch together. It's going to be a beautiful day like it is today. So uh, invite your friends to come and join us. If you love Park City's Baptist Church, be here. And what we're going to do, we, we've said in the end, all this exclamation point on it is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. All right. So let's do it again. We've been saying it every week. Let's say it together right now. Okay. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations and forever and ever. Amen. And amen. So today we're going to take a look at two snapshots out of the book of Acts. We've been reading through the book of Acts together. Again, all of our members, if you're a guest, you can join us, um, get a bookmark today. We're reading through the book of Acts every day. So you read this some time ago. We're going to be looking at a, a passage in Acts 2. You can grab your Bible. We're going to be in Acts 2 and Acts 4. Bring your Bible every time we gather. Acts 2 and Acts 4. But before we get there, I'll place it in context. Always important. Jesus has said, okay, you're going to be my witnesses in Acts 1.8. He says, you're going to be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem because that's where they were. Then these concentric circles of influence as love send us out, sends us out. Okay. Always sends us out. J Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and the ends of the earth. We talked about this recently that here is the mission. And now we're seeing it played out. It's also, you could say, an outline of the book of Acts. It's where it goes. Jesus said it would go there. And so here's what happens. We're sent out. But now I want us to look at this alternative community that's been formed. This is, as we celebrate our history, um, always, we figured out that the key to the future is to unlock the past. 
because we see what God has done in our church and what makes us distinct from all other churches on the planet, a collective group of people with certain gifts and resource to bring. Uh, but we're going way back. We're going all the way back to the church in the book of Acts and say, how can we learn and apply to our, to our own church? So we see this alternative um, community of worshipers, which is, by the way, the most beautiful force for good on the planet. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like the local church. Wherever it shows up to be the church, not simply, again, to gather and sing songs and go, wow, that was great. That was some good music. That was preaching. You know, it was, uh, I mean, it was okay, but now let's go on to life. No, we come together. We say it this way. We gather in order to be scattered. And that's what the early church did. They came together and it transformed everything. I want you to see chapter two of, uh, of Acts, verse 41. This is day one. Of the early church. I mean, now he's describing the days that followed um, Pentecost. Look at this. So those who received his word were baptized. And if you ever wondered, I've always wondered, how do you baptize? Look at this. 3,000 people. How does that happen? Until you go and, un, and, and realize recently, mikvahs, Jewish baptismals, have been found in recent days and they continue to find them all over this place where Peter preached this message. I taught on these steps. And before you get there, you have to walk around all these, these ruins of mikvahs all over the place. So it would have been natural. 3,000 people saved. How are we going to be baptized? Bam, right here. It's, I mean, amazing. And they devoted themselves, circle that word, word. devoted themselves the word is proskartereo in the Greek, okay? It means, it means radically passionate about, okay? What were they passionate about? Check this. They devoted themselves, that's key, together to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Notice the articles, the the articles. They're in the Greek. They're in the Greek, so this is important. The fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had everything, all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. This is what happens in our church. I say it this way. If you have a lot, give a lot. If you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. Everybody does their part. And those who are in need can, can have their needs met. It starts here. And they were selling their possessions, belonging, distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They just kept gathering. They couldn't but get together. They couldn't keep each other away from one another. They wanted to be together. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. This is key. And having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus said that he would build his church. It's his church. He said he would build it. That's what he's doing. And he's doing it right here, right now in our day. These are amazing days to be a part of our church. That word proskartereo, okay, that's the key verb is how this breaks down the syntax. And then there's qualifiers. What, what were they passionate about? Did you catch it? This, this word, again, it means staying fixed on one thing, hyper-focused and passionate about one thing in one direction. And here it is, this, this movement of this church, they were devoted to the teaching and explanation of God's word, what we would call the gospels today, the teachings of Jesus. They would, they would unpack the gospel like we do every week. We continue to do what our four bears did. And then the fellowship. You might know that word koinonia. This is not just gathering together and talking about the weather or how about them cowboys. You know, it's not that. You, we can do that. But it's, it's a love for one another that is like the love of Jesus. Koinonia is to love each other just like Jesus loves me. It's, it's Paul's uh, Philippians 2 where he says, considering others more important than yourself. This is radical stuff. You don't find this anywhere in, on the planet, but in the local church, there's a love that drives everything that we do. And so this, this, they were passionate about fellowship. They were passionate about the breaking of bread, the prayers. This is worship, is what this is. The, the, the Lord's Supper together, communion together. But notice they were together, praising God together. 
So all of this, their gatherings were the result of what Christ had done and the resurrection that had taken place not too many days and ascension too many days before that. They didn't have like an attendance challenge, you know, they didn't bring a, there's bonus if you show up, receive a gift. They had none of that. You couldn't keep them apart. They had to be together. Do you feel that? Do you have this sense? I, that all week long, I, I just want to be with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Because when we come together, we praise God together and it changes us. But they didn't just stay together. That wasn't the point. In fact, if, if, if churches turn inward, churches implode when we just focus on ourselves. Which is why we have a practice of giving away. Not just for ourselves, but because of the grace of Christ that's changed us. So what are the marks of a worshiping community? What does that look like and, and how do we measure up? I think I would give us some high marks here, but I want you to think about yourself, you as the church. Yes, together. So another snapshot, turn to Acts four, just two verse. I mean, two chapters later, Acts chapter four. Now another snapshot in Acts four It's similar, but I want you to catch a few things here. This is the first uh, mega church. This is a term that, that used to be used for big churches. We would be, I think the designation, we'd be a mega church, but a mega church in, in, in the New Testament, mega means, do you know what it means? It doesn't mean big. It means great. Mega means great. What makes a great church? That's what we want to be, regardless of the size of a church. What makes a great church? Well, first thing I want you to see in chapter 4, verse 32. Look at verse 32. They had great unity. Great unity. This is in large part why we are focused in these days. What is it that unites us? Because there's so much that unites us in, our, in, in multiple venues and multiple generations, multiple languages, ethnicities, all the things. What unites us? Great unity. Look at verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And no one, one heart and one soul, catch that. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to them was his own. But they had everything in common. There it is again, like Acts 2. I want you to see this. They also had great power. We were talking about this at the pastor's study on Wednesday night. The thing that marks the reading that we're going through is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That's what separated them. And if you're a believer, the power of God lives in you, the same power that we see here. It's this, uh, you might know, it's dunamis is the word. It's dynamite power. They had, verse 33, mega power. That's the word. With the, with the apostles, with, with great power, were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's the power. We said it last week. It's the clarity of the gospel. Christ's death and resurrection, his death on the cross for our sin. That's the demarcation point. That's the scandal, is to go all the way there, and yet that's the power that changes lives. Without that, Christianity is like this feel-good, work-harder, get-better religion. That's not the gospel. The gospel is what Christ has done for us. He's come. He's died on the cross for our sin. He took on the punishment for us. He died on the cross he, as our substitute. He was buried, and he was raised again, experienced a death so that we wouldn't have to die. And he's raised up so that we could be raised up with him. Just as we see in, in baptism, we then follow him. It is the great power of the Holy Spirit in us, the resurrection. And then look at this mega grace was upon them. Great grace was upon them. We had great unity. There was great power. We had great grace that resulted in, look at this, great generosity, great generosity of, of their lives. I know we, we often think of, of money. Yes, we see a lot of that going on here. Everything they had, time, resource, my gifts. We're going to talk about that today. Look at verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. Imagine. And I see that in our church. If you're in a connect group, if you had need, you bring that to the group. I, I mean, story after story of how connect groups step up. And even our, our church family at large, helping people who are in need. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them 
and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is so beautiful. Look at this. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, kind of a nickname as we know him, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I have seen this happen over and over again. You have done this over and over again. And instead of, watch this, instead of buying another house, I got a house, I want a house in the mountain. I got another house, I'm gonna have another house. Instead, they were selling their houses. They were selling their houses in order to give all that they had. They were saying, I'm gonna sacrifice everything because what's happening here matters. It was an overflow of what Christ had done in their lives. See, to be a Christian means that we are totally others focused. In our church, friends, you've heard it already today. Our church does this as well as any church on the planet that I know of. And you would expect it. To whom much is given, much is required. But the amount and percentage of money and resource that we give away from ourselves is staggering. And you're a part of that. If you give to our unified budget and, and, and all that God is doing, and so many people who guide and lead with wisdom and prayer, members who lead that process, it's just incredible. And it starts here. It starts right here with each other. Uh, next, uh, after, after this uh, next Sunday, we're going to start a new series on the one another's following this to say, what does a church like this look like? How can we serve one another? How do we worship with one another? All of those things coming up as it lead us to then Advent, Christmas coming fast. But here's the question I want us to ask. And I'm going to get real practical now as we land the plane here. What's your ministry? What is your ministry? We talk to our deacons all the time about this because you, you answer that one quickly. You know what your ministry is. But I want to ask you, because every member, watch this, is a minister. Every member is a minister. What is your ministry? And here it is. Your service to others is your ministry. How are you serving others? And I want to talk about how specifically we can do this. And this week, to send us out, I'm going to we're going to commission you as you go out into the week as ministers. But at times, and I think it's often the case, what is your specific ministry, even here at the church? How do you serve first here? Because look at this. You were created to serve God. Everyone on the planet has been created to serve God, whether they know it or not. Every Palestinian, every Israeli, every Jew, every Christian, every Muslim, every atheist, every somewhere in between. Every person on the planet has been created in the image of God and to serve him, to be co-laborers and workers with him, every person. You've been created to, to serve God. You've been saved to serve God. You were saved if you're a Christian. You now, in response to what he's done for you, you have been saved specifically to live and to serve like him. They, they go together. You're called to serve God. See, your call to salvation included your call to serve. Do you understand this? It's not just someday I'm going to get beamed up to heaven and I'm ready because I accepted Jesus. No, 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 no. you've accepted Christ in order to serve. What is your ministry? They're one and the same. To be called to salvation is to be called to serve. You see, a non-serving Christian is a contradiction in terms. Cannot happen. I would argue that your serving of others, your outward focus is proof that you're saved. We say this often. It's not our good works that save us. But salvation will always be followed by good works. And, and in the church, it means to be a devoted member means that you are serving. What happens when one part of your body is not, is not functioning properly? I know a lot of people, you probably do, who've been sick lately, right? Whether it's allergies or something else, a lot of people. When your body, something's wrong in your body and you're sick, something's not functioning properly. And in the body of Christ, when someone is not serving the body is not fully uh, meeting its redemptive potential. And it's not as healthy as it could be. And if you're not serving, if you can't answer that question, and you come here to be served, okay, first, yes, we're here to serve you. And sometimes we go, that we all need each other. That's why we come together too. So I'm not saying we don't come with great needs. Or even seasons when we go, Jeff, I'm, 
It's kind of beating me down. I, I can't serve right now. I've got a lot going on. I bet that you have opportunities in your personal life to serve. We're going to talk about that. So all of us have been called to serve. But you see, what, what happens is in the body, if there's something that's, that you're not doing, then something not happening that could be happening. There's some ministry that's not taking place and we're not reaching our fullest redemptive potential because you're not all in, as it were. See, there are thousands of churches, you know this, that are dying all over America and around the world, particularly in the global West. And most of them are dying because of Christians who are unwilling to serve. Who, and this has happened in, in the American church in big ways, who come as consumers. This is a major shift that I want you to experience today. If you come here to be served instead of serving like Jesus taught us to live, it will change everything. If you come to be served, then you're a consumer. A consumer is always a critic. And so what can happen, let's be honest, it can happen we, it can happen to all of us. We, we leave today. And if we got into a conversation or maybe somebody wasn't here, hey, how was worship today? The answer ought to be, I don't know, you, you tell me. <laughs> you were the worshiper. How'd it go? What did you bring to the Lord? Or how was church today? I don't know. You, you, you tell me, you're the church. Were you serving others? Did you show up to serve? Did you get to bless someone? Did you have an encouraging conversation? Did you get to hold babies? Were you teaching? Were you guiding in your connect group? Did you hold the door open? You tell me. How was church? You see, we get into those conversations because we believe that, that the church is here for us. Consumers become critics. And critics are never happy. And so I just want to challenge you with that. If you're kind of not so joyful, or maybe, you know, church, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'll guarantee you, watch this. If you are stagnant in your Christian life these days, it's likely because you are not serving. You're totally focused on yourself. And I've never met a selfish, self-focused, happy person ever. So I want you to see this. You're Created to serve, saved to serve, called to serve. You are commanded to serve the Lord. But watch this. It's for our good. See, the great question that I want us all to ask is for you. What's your ministry? Because that's where the joy comes from. That's where we gain traction and where the spirit shows up. It's one thing. You're being challenged today by the spirit of God through my voice. You're being challenged. But it's not until you actually obey you act on what you're hearing from the Spirit that then it triggers the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's when the power shows up. When we obey him, are you doing that in these days? See, the mature follower of Jesus stops asking, how can everybody else meet my needs? In my family or in my friend group or you know, my roommate, how are they going to meet my needs today? Or whatever it might be. In the church, we step in and we say, how can I meet needs here? And, and I mean, we do that in spades around here. It's amazing. But I so want this for you. It's not to get from you. And you may be wondering, well, where can I serve? What can I do? Um, listen, it's not rocket science. It's, it's really not. Again, can you hold a baby? I know that Lisetta Lear sent an email out to all of her, our preschool workers today. If you're one of them, you received it. And it basically said, I see you. I see you. The Lord sees you. We hide out in, in certain rooms and, and hold babies in quiet places and we serve them, our littlest disciples that we're making. Maybe you can uh, come alongside a grieving person in need. Can you, can you sit with someone and listen? Can you take a vase of flowers with a ministry team we have that goes and blesses people who are, who are homebound who may not hear from anybody else in the church that whole week? Or be present with someone. Could you do that? Could you host a home? Do you have a, maybe a ministry of hospitality? Do you like to organize things? Do you, do you like technology? Or do you like to serve um, and, and, and help people with needs that they have? Whatever it might be. Maybe you like to go to the hospital. Do you sing? Play an instrument? Because here's the thing I want you to see. You are shaped to serve God. 
You've been shaped uniquely by him. This is a simple cross. You can write this down, by the way, as we're seeking to answer the question, um, where will I serve? All right. You can, you can, um, you can take, take notes here, write down, take this with you. But I want, to, I want to show you something. This is real simple, but I think it's very practical and helpful today. It's an acrostic shape. Um, the S is spiritual gifts, okay? What God-empowered abilities do you have? Now, think with me here. D- just just think, think deeply about this. We see this in 1 Corinthians 12. We see it in Romans 12. We see it in Ephesians 4. Uh, 1 Peter 4 alludes to it or, or goes there, touches on them. Um, spiritual gifts are things like hospitality. They, they're things like uh, serving. Helping is a spiritual gift. Um, administrating, organizing, leadership. Again, it's not rocket science. It's what is the need? I'm here to meet it. And, and yet we hit certain, of it, certain ones of us have passions for certain things. So that's, that's the, the, the spiritual gifts. The next one is heart, H. What are your passions? What do you love to talk about? What gets your heart racing? What makes you angry? Uh, what is it that you can't stand anymore? That will inform your ministry, your passion. It's how God's wired you. People don't have certain passions that you do or that I may have. And yet we all together have them. Abilities is the next one. What natural talents do you have? Any number, any talent you have has been given to you by God and can be used in ministry. Look for it. Watch for it. Contact our offices. How can I serve? Talk to us after the service today. Personality is another one. How has God wired you? Are you an introvert, an extrovert? Do you love being with people? Do people exhaust you? Exhaust you, you love them, but not, not, I get too much. Um, maybe you're that way. Maybe you want to uh, be in a, in a private, focused, you know, kind of ministry of some sort. What is it for you? It takes all of our wonderful personalities to make it happen. That's the beauty of the church, the body, literally, of Christ. And then E is experience. What's your story? Now, listen to this one. This is so important. What have you been through? And we've all been through a lot. And the Bible tells us, we see this in 2 Corinthians, we see it in in 1 Peter, uh, where the scriptures say that we have gone through certain things and we've received some comfort and some learning through the things we've gone through in order that, watch this, we might bring that same comfort to others. You know this is true. If someone's an addict, the best person to come alongside them as a sponsor is an addict, recovering addict. Someone who's been through grief can join grief share or divorce care or whatever the ministry is. What is it that you've been through? We've all been through a lot. What, are you, what have you lost? What are you grieving? How can God use you to redeem that thing and serve others instead of staying in it? Instead, get outside of yourself. It's a mind sh- uh, mind, mindset shift that will help you. So the question today, again, what's your ministry? And I want all of us to answer this. How, who, where will you serve? The question we're asking today, the key question is, again, where will you serve? Next week, as we go through all of these questions again, the cumulative, the cumulative answer is, I'm all in. I'm all in. So where are you serving? And now, if you want to know more, okay, very practical. On our website, you can go there. I want to show you. You can go to our website. And on the website, there is a serve page. That you can go to. Just click on that serve page. It's simple. And, it'll, and you scroll down. You can see all of our ministry partners, mission partners that we have. You can contact us and say, well, I, just, I want to help with babies. We need those who would help in our pre- growing preschool ministry and with children. What is your ministry? It'll change everything. If you show up here on a Sunday morning, maybe it's a Wednesday night, other times to say, I'm here to serve, not to be served. And for some of you, it's like a second, it's not salvation again, but it's like an awakening. It changes everything. Because that's where the power of God shows up. And it'll get you out of a stagnant spiritual rut that some of us have found ourselves in. You're there because you're not serving. The Dead Sea is dead for a reason. There's no outflow. The water has nowhere to go. And so what I want us to do is answer the question, how will you serve? Well, with unity and power. That's how. And however the Lord calls you. Who who will you serve? Whomever he puts in front of you. Where will you serve wherever you go? You know, I, I've talked about this um, recently 
And it's been so freeing for me. We're during COVID and the pandemic, you know, asking, wow, what is, what's success in this whole thing we're doing here as a church? You know, when you can't even show up. And the Lord really um, has been teaching me and I've been seeking to live this way. And it's been so freeing to say, I'm going to go into every day and I'm going to be focused. Fill with the spirit. I want to be focused. And here it is with whomever he puts in front of me, focused in the moment. And whatever he's called me to do, wherever he places me. And if we can live that way, friends, this week, when helpers are needed, we can say, Lord, find me. When people are looking for helpers, I want to be found. I want to live that way. I want to live that way every single day. And you can too. Wherever you go, wherever you're going in the morning, wherever you find yourself this week, at school, at work, in your home to be the helper and you will be the one to receive the great joy of the Lord. So I want us to, to pray together. I want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes, all of us in all of our worship services. And I want to ask you, um, how's the Lord speaking in your heart today? How has he gifted you? Again, it's not rocket science. What is it that you do? What are you passionate about? How will you Use the gifts he's given you to serve. Lord, we thank you that you have given us all the ability to serve. And you have shown us the way. You didn't come to serve uh, or to be, be served, but to serve us. So friend, if you've never received Christ, he died on the cross for your sin. He took on your shame, your punishment. And you can receive his, his grace right now by faith. Say, Lord, come into my heart. I give you my life to serve you by serving others. Lord, may we never be the same. And as we go this week into our world, our place of influence, may we be found as servants, helpers, wherever you take us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.